for longer than three decades, the residents of Peabody witnessed a legacy in the making, a trimaran carved to a symbol that would unite a thousand. To hear the full story, I visited New Hampshire to meet Carl and Lisa. Wilson Labeo was my stepdad, married my mom about 18 years ago or so. And At Lowell Street in Peabody, Massachusetts, Wilson was building a 45-foot Roger Simpson trimaran, a lifelong project that started back in 1984 with the help of his father. And after 32 years in the making, a freak accident took Wilson's life, putting his dreams into a halt. So he was working in the backyard mm -hmm. and he was cutting brush right in front of the boat along the brook. And um, we don't really know totally exactly what happened. My mom called me and said, he hadn't been in the house, and I said, well, call the police right away. Maybe. Wilson died in August of 2017 at the age of 76. His wife Peggy died months later from an illness. Leaving behind was Wilson's unfinished dream, Foxy Lady. What did you guys know about the project? How invested were you? Well, that's, that's really why I was so passionate at the end here to get the boat done and to find a good home for the boat mm -hmm. because I really wasn't very invested in the boat and I felt really bad about that. Um, I think other family members and kids, other stepchildren that Wilson had growing up probably put a lot of time into helping him with the boat. Tell us about what this boat, he said it meant so much to him. What was his vision? The boat is humongous. Yeah, so the boat, he um, had studied different options to build. He wanted to obviously have, um, have a boat that he could sail and race on the weekends. And um, he decided on that particular style of boat, the trimaran, because um, it gave him the ability to have a cruising boat that he could, you know, um, take long trips on if he wanted to, but he could also race it on the weekends. And so um, he somehow came across some plans for this Roger Simpson design. You know, Wilson had a different idea in mind of what he wanted to do with the boat. Mm -hmm. So most people, I was told, build a, a foam boat. Um, and this is a cold molded boat. Yeah. Nobody would really build a cold molded boat because it would take too much time and it would be too expensive, even though it's beautiful. Wilson's design exceeded every expectation. He shaped the, the hull into a different design and the wings and the armors are a different design. So when I actually started to research the boat to try to find one, mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything that looked like that boat. So you think of all the images on Google mm -hmm. of all the boats in the world and like you couldn't find another one like it. If you Google um, Roger Simpson Leahona, now you'll see Wilson's boat. So when you lost Wilson and then you lost your mother, mm -hmm. Then the boat was left behind, and as right. you said, you knew he was working on it, but you weren't queuing in all the details, all the plans. Right. So to walk us the steps. You wanted to sell the boat, but we wanted to find the right person. Right. Well, you know, I just, you kind of walk out to the boat, and you take it all in, you know, and you're like, oof, where do I start, right? And so you kind of look around inside the boat and see where he was at. So he had his wire list out and he had all his wiring tools and he was pulling wire and, and starting to wire everything up. And, um, you know, looking at the outside of the boat, you could see that it was weathered and at the point where it really needed attention on the outside. As beautiful as the boat was, Carl and Lisa were facing one big question. What to do with the boat? 
Having no passion to own a boat, nor the funds to finish and maintain the boat, they started looking for the one who would not only buy Wilson's boat, but see his dreams into fruition. It was kind of an odd duck. I was told many times, well, if you're going to find a trimaran person, you know, that's a needle in the haystack, you know, because it takes a special person that's going to want that boat. The clock was ticking faster than they could manage. They had a year to make a decision. One of the last people that was really serious that was on the boat um, from like um, October, November of last year into May of this year, um, he had come and sort of done his survey, cleaned up the boat, helped reorganize everything, and, and then he was actually looking at another boat mm. to take a look at the rigging to see how he was going to rig that, that, this boat. Oh, okay. And they offered him that boat for the cost of the move. So when he backed out at the, end, at the beginning of June, we were like devastated because we had just let him go the entire winter without advertising the boat to anybody else or working with anybody else to take the boat. And this time, the boat was still at the property, right? Correct. Yeah, and you guys had already sold the house. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah. we had till August 10th to get the boat out of the property, or we would have to salvage it and split the proceeds with the owner of the house. Yeah. So you were looking for somebody, the right person. You thought you found the right person. You stopped advertising. That deal fell through. Right. Now you're desperate. Right. But there was a gentleman before Garth that we, we weren't quite sure about. He was young, he was 24, had a lot of passion. He worked at a boat yard, did fiberglass work, that sort of thing. Mm. He was an Eagle Scout. His name was Jesse from Maine. And Jesse had big plans for the boat. Um, and he actually had invested um, you know, money into the final survey. Mm. He invested money into the boat move because he had to have a deposit down. Mm. So we felt really bad for Jesse. He ran into some financial issues like a week before the boat was supposed to move and said that he couldn't do it. And I, and, and I had gone down to visit with Tim. So Tim was a homeowner. Mm. Um, we sat down on the back deck and I said, so Tim, we're not gonna make the 10th what would you like to do? You want to cut the boat up, salvage it? He said, nope. He goes, we can't cut that boat up. He said, Wilson will haunt me the rest of my life. <laughs> and I said, okay. So we, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> I, he said, try to find another person to take the boat. You are at his mercy. You, yeah, right? absolutely, yeah. yeah. And with the opportunity call, and Lisa went back to the old list, looking at those who had shown earnest interest. Um, I was just going on all the Facebook pages that had those, and we basically at that point had come up with um, the idea that we would give the boat away if For somebody free. would pay to move it. To move it. And finish it and not salvage it. Uh, yeah. That so was, you got, was it a desperate uh, decision or what was it? Well, we were told that the boat needed like fifty to $75,000 worth of work. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it only fair to whoever the potential buyer, taker, if you will, even though we weren't selling, but whoever was going to take the boat needed to have at least that jump start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with uh, just the investment of the move mm -hmm. in order to kind of make it feasible. Mm -hmm. But what needed to go along with that would be the knowledge to do it because you really, if you paid somebody to do all the work on the boat, you might spend a couple hundred thousand and the boat would never be worth a couple hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. So who would do that? They phoned not only one person, but two, Dave and Court. It could have maybe gone either way. I think Wilson's craftsmanship and the uniqueness of the boat and the whole story really got to David. You know, it's like he saw the passion that Wilson, you know, had put into the boat with the construction 
and just, I think, deep down inside, being a boat guy, he said, no, this boat can't get cut up. And so the challenge began, the actual logistics, to how they will move a 32-year-old boat off the property. Since Wilson's boat was wider than the traditional trimarans, the permit to transport it would have to come straight from the governor's office. Maybe about three weeks before we were going to move the boat, I got a call from Cindy at Brownell, the boat moving company, and she said, we got a little bit of a problem. The boat's 30 feet wide and mass DOT only allows 16 foot wide loads over the road. Through the connection of an old friend, Carr was able to get in touch with Senator Tarr's office, which then he was connected with the head of Massachusetts Department of Transportation. And Mr. Uh, Fody wrote back and he said, Mr. Hanselman, he said, I've lived on the North Shore a good part of my life and I've traveled down Lowell Street and I know exactly where your boat is and when you guys are ready to move your boat, we'll have your permit ready to go. While the planning was taking place, Wilson's boat was garnering attraction of its own. Neighbors and strangers sharing their memories of Wilson and what the boat meant to them. So when the moving day was scheduled, Carl, Lisa, David and Court found themselves surrounded with strangers eager to help. That was surreal. You just can't imagine like the the events in those two days, right? So it started on Tuesday morning with the crane. And so the excitement of lifting that boat like 65 feet up in the air and over the top of the trees was like, what's going to happen? What if they drop the boat? It had never moved out of that spot, like for 30, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so just to see it move from that spot to the driveway was a big deal. And just to see how big it was when it was up in the air coming down beside that barn was like, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, it's huge. It was like you thought it was just gonna go right on top of the barn. It was so big. Yeah. son and um, my son-in-law Keenan, we stopped because they had to drop signs for the boat to go by. The hulls were so wide when it went up onto 128. So as the boat went by, we ran out, put the signs back up and screwed them back together. So we were sort of following the boat along. And there it was, a moment 32 years in the making. Wilson's boat touching the water. For me, it was a bigger deal watching the rudder hit the water, because that was like the first thing that touched the water. Everybody was excited when it floated in the water and stuff. I was just like, this boat just to touch the water is incredible, right? So um, that was a big deal for me. I yelled when the rudder hit the water, but um, it finally eased down into the water. For now, we're going to take it down to Marathon, Florida in the Middle Keys, and we'll probably spend a year, maybe two, making, making everything complete. Um, you know, when, when Wilson died, everything was left unfinished. Um, so much has been done, but there's still a lot of work to do. So, But uh, even as she is now, just under motor without the sails, um, I would still take her out on day trips or you know, local things in the Keys. Um, she's got a fantastic motor. She's a lot of fun on the water, so I, uh, I don't feel like I have to wait for it to be done before she can start seeing some adventures. Well, we we have been looking for a, a larger vessel, and this boat suits pretty much any and all, all of our needs for what we want to do sailing and cruising. And the, the like I said, the, the craftsmanship of the build w was so well done that and the possibility of if nobody took it, it could be 
cut up and you know parts the engine salvaged and all the, all those years of work and would just go right down the drain so uh, I felt the need to save the boat from from the landfill when you got the boat what did you have to do in order to get into the water for the first time Ooh, that's a long list uh, we did a lot of uh, fiberglass repair well, we spent 10 days working on the boat mostly every night till midnight and we'd get up and, and I was chilly here so we'd get up around 8 and start at it again and when they came for the boat uh, to, to transport it to the launch ramp at 1.30 in the morning we were, we were still working on it and we were like holy cow we're out of time <laughs> so we got to the launch ramp and, and worked a few eh, maybe another hour or so and we got about two hours of sleep and got up and started working again even uh, right when they were ready to launch I was, I was still installing like the the strainer for the water intake for the engine I'd like forgotten about and we had we had uh, it was a variable pitch three blade prop and we had one of the blades backwards and one of the crew members of Brownell uh, the transport crew had noticed that so they focused on that and got that proper for us because we were just so tired we, we couldn't even brain it <laughs> I could look at instructions and just go eh. this is this is definitely something that um, an individual would craft this is more artwork than factory well, uh, where do you where are some places that you could point out to say this is pure Wilson um, here, right? the bones in the boat um, he put in an escape hatch and that's cool in and of itself but anywhere where we might take water from say an open window mm. or um, something like that instead of it, it running all the way down or sitting on the ledge he drilled holes so that it it runs down and instead of staying on so he 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 thought of all the contingencies for if this happens and if that happens and uh <laughs> How long do you think this boat will last? To answer that question, easily 30 years, even though this boat is already like 32 years into its build. It was, I think the first 15 years, it was built inside a building and then assembled three pieces into one. And then it was, it was, it was tarped and covered for, for winter, which really helped. Even uh, Carl and Lisa, uh, after Wilson's passing, they would cover the boat for the winter to keep the, the, the rain and snow and whatnot off of it. So that really that really helped save this boat. If it was just left out, uncovered, it would not be in the shape that it's in now. Both of your hearts are rest to know that you have done Wilson proud and you have honored his wishes. Do you, do you feel more at peace? I, I, I do, I, for sure, because I, I felt like that w I couldn't really relax or think about a lot of other stuff um, until that boat was sort of safe and moved and knew it was going to continue its life. I just felt like um, I had to, had to do it. And, People said that they couldn't believe that we put that much time and effort into it and all the hurdles and everything that we went through. Looking back on it now, of course it was well worth it, you know? It was a, uh, I, I said, aside from raising, uh, you know, two great kids and my family and everything else, maybe one of the most important things that I ever did in my life was save that boat felt that passionate about it, you know, and, um, and yeah, not having spent as much time with Wilson as I, I should have, I, you made it up. I felt like, you know, a lot of people worked on the boat, a lot of people invested a lot of time, but Lisa and I got it in the water, and I just felt like that was our contribution to the boat. The yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, felt sad that, you know, Wilson never got to see the boat in the water or ne never got to sail his boat. But I just really feel like that was, that was his mission on Earth, was to build that boat, just to touch all the people that he touched along the way.